upon a time on the internet Three girls, they never met But somehow they became friends We're in three different countries In three different time zones So really it must have been fate Girl stuff is how we like to communicate Our thoughts and feelings Stories that can make you relate And we talked to some cool people We met on the way So thanks for tuning in We hope that you like your stay Hey, I'm Hannah I'm Ella I'm Mel. And I'm Stephen Kramer Glickman. And today we have Stephen with us on Ghost of Podcast. And we are so excited. Uh, we're going to talk all about music and podcasts and obviously Big Time Rush. But before we start off, Stephen, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do, what you do for fun? Sure. Um, well, I starred on a TV show called Big Time Rush for about five years um, as uh, the manager of the band Gustavo Rock. Um, then uh, after doing that, went over uh, uh, to Warner Brothers and worked for three years on a film called Storks, an animated movie uh, which starred uh, me and Jennifer Aniston and Andy Samberg. I've been a stand-up comic for 16 years. Um, my podcast, The Nighttime Show, is uh, about to hit its 200th episode, which is a very fun thing. And uh, I live in Los Angeles, but I am a Canadian from, uh, yes. from Canada. Yeah. And it's from Canada, so represent. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, I'm from I'm from Toronto, so we're just we're oh, just cool, cool here. In London, Ontario. London, Ontario. There we go. <laughs> awesome. Um, so, Stephen, can you tell us one thing that you did during quarantine that you otherwise would not have had the time to do? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, quarantine was a pretty. Uh, groundbreaking time in my life to be honest pretty but uh, pretty big changes um went through a massive breakup after nine years with somebody that was like a huge huge life change um which has been for the best and has been as you know in the end has been you know pretty good pretty cool um i uh um got to write a lot and do a lot of cool writing projects for movies and tv type stuff which is very exciting um and then i got to record uh my first album which has um been extremely cool and i've gotten to work with a lot of people that i've been a fan of for a long time and have never been able to work with in the past like like um kendall from big time rush who uh came in and produced uh, one of the songs and I uh, got to work with musicians from REM and the Foo Fighters and Pink and No Doubt and a bunch of other uh, places and it's it's just continued to be a, a very uh, nice residual part of uh, of having quarantined. I, I mean some of the musicians I haven't seen in person like I haven't seen Kendall face to face but we've been we talked last night and you know i think at one o'clock in the morning for an like an hour and a half yeah, we, we met a couple months ago so oh my god that's amazing that's a that's a that's so awesome and and i think that's the cool thing like even though we are kind of just staying at home we still get to connect with people from all over i mean just on this call we've got germany we've got you in la i'm in canada and ella's in chicago so we're like all over just taken over wow. <laughs> that's beautiful what a cool way to do something yeah and it's I think it's it's also very interesting because technology and things like just doesn't work out all the time but getting to work through that with other people who also are just in the same boat is kind of cool and kind of fun um but other than just like work what kind of fun things did you get to do during quarantine did you binge any shows did you pick up a new hobby yeah yeah um um, I, uh, I did a lot of home decorating stuff, um, you know, things that like I've always wanted to do, like uh, uh, you behind me, um, that's this building behind me. This is a, not a Zoom background. This is my actual 
bedroom. Oh, wow. And that's over there is uh that's my that's the house I grew up in over there. Aww. And then um behind me, that's the apartment that I lived in in Brooklyn for many years. Um so I mean my whole bedroom is a mural like a photorealistic mural of my my favorite places I've grown I grew up in or lived in for a long time. So that's the kind of stuff like where like I always wanted to do that. And then, you know, uh during quarantine was like, hey, you know what? Let's let's actually do it. Like let's figure it out. Let's figure out how to do this. And it came out really cool. It's been it's been neat, you know. Other things, a little uh like I I've done a lot of painting um which has been cool um tv wise man bridgerton so cool we all the three of us actually watched it all together like over like did? like video chat like we also binged it it was we're obsessed with it too yeah. <laughs> i think ella more than everyone else because she's a big musical person so she really enjoyed bridgerton, the musical stuff all over tiktok amazing amazing <laughs> incredible i'm obsessed <laughs> yeah i love it i love it oh i'm also i've also uh prided myself on being one of the worst cooks in america <laughs> for a very very long time and uh i just um it, it, you know what's <laughs> such a funny and strange thing is uh i started dating somebody um a, a couple months ago and uh it's going really well and during that that process, um, like I realized that this n new person I'm seeing did, did, does not uh, know that I am the worst cook in America. <laughs> so instead of being the worst cook in America, I called uh, a friend who's an actual chef and was like, can you teach me how to cook things? And I will learn. And we did it live on Instagram. He started teaching me how to make steak and oh, like on the like on the stove like uh if I wanted to like cook cook steak and <laughs> if I wanted to cook chicken if I wanted to make brussels sprouts if I want to make different you know meals like how to do it and so I've been cooking uh for for her and I and uh it's so cool because she's like she's like oh my god you're such a good cook and I'm like yeah that's right I'm the best you know <laughs> <laughs> N needless, yeah, you know, but she has no idea that you Health know character that, development. Oh yeah, hell yeah! That's I mean, that's like right out of a movie. Like to be like, I'm gonna learn how to be better at something, and then you know, and then do it. Actually, do it. It's like it's pretty cool. I'm very, I'm very into that. I'm really into cooking. Like I've been getting better at it, and I'm making myself, you know meals on a very regular basis instead of just you know <laughs> adding to the stock portfolio of postmates <laughs> and so what has been your favorite dish that you've gotten to learn how to cook i mean i know that like it's not it's not m much of a dish but like i like i used to my, like during before quarantine I would go out to like a restaurant, like a steakhouse and order like a big steak. And it was always like, you know, 40, 50 bucks for a, for a, you know, for the steak and the thing and the stuff. So making that myself and have it be just as good, if not better. And it just feels so cool. Like it just feels like I'm somehow it's like I got a cheat code. Like I figured out how to get get around something. That's like it's just such a simple thing, but it's cool. Like it's nice to have like a new skill. You know? That's true. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on to just the the music aspect of things. So Ella is gonna take yeah. it away from here. For sure. Um, before we talk all about music, I would actually love to dive a little bit deeper into, I guess, what we would call your origin story and just how you discovered your passion and your talent for performing, whether that be acting or singing or comedy. Like, where, what would you consider like your origin story? Um, well, you know, I, I probably like, I, I consider myself to be an entertainer, like through and through, uh, because. I, I really 
like whether it's writing or it's comedy or it's music or it's acting you know what whatever way shape or form it takes place like it brings me just as much happiness as the next one like people are always kind of trying to figure out like what is the one thing that i'm the most passionate about and it's like they're all really fun musical theater is probably the closest to my heart out of everything because it's written the best and it's uh it contains probably the sum of so many parts of of what what's good about music and and acting and performing and stuff like that um but it all kind of it's it all started for me being like a kid and performing for my family my you know we we were one of those families where you'd perform in the living room for the grandparents when they came over and stuff like that i would you know sing a song my sister would sing a song i'd put on a magic show you know things like that like it didn't matter we were just doing stuff just to just to entertain the family and and then it kind of made the leap from that to doing that for our classroom, you know, and do it'd be like show and tell time. And I'd be like, here's what I'm going to show this song that I learned, you know, and then I'd sing a song for all the kids in my class and stuff like that. I was always very, really wanted to like perform all the time. And um, I did some somewhere around four musicals a year from the time I was in the second or third grade until I graduated from high school. So I was doing tons of shows, like just back to back. If I was always in a, in a musical, back to back to back to back to back. So a lot of times the same one, you know, just, a, you know, I think I did The Wizard of Oz like four times. I did Fiddler on the Roof five times, you know, like so many shows because you just, you just want to, you know, keep it going. And, uh, you know, it, it led me to going to school for it. So I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in Los Angeles, and then left there to go to the American Musical Dramatic Academy in New York. And I graduated from there. Then I did a tour of a terrible musical um, that dropped me in Los Angeles. Um, uh, weirdly enough, where they were doing stand-up comedy, uh, I ended up finding a bunch of comedians and then left the tour to become a stand-up comedian and moved onto a comedian's couch. And that, you know, kind of became my life for many, many years. And, and it led me back to musical theater and then to television. So it's, it's a, uh, you know it was a you know it's a, a weird way around it but you know i think uh it's always kind of it's it's always kind of been there in my life it's uh, you know entertaining is always entertainment's always been a big part of it do you think that there was a specific like aha moment or like a tipping point for you where you decided i'm going to do this like professionally like for the rest of my life or did it kind of just start and then snowball and then it just next thing you know you were doing it and doing it and doing it and there there are some moments there are some moments in my history that are like where you just take a deep breath and you step up one level like um i was uh living on a guy's couch um uh, during the tour and uh, you know after the tour when i started doing stand-up i was sleeping on this comedian's couch and he took me to a place i think it was called the sagebrush cantina in malibu like near malibu and they had a piano and uh it was a busy night at this place and someone said to me oh that guy over there that guy Ari he's the booker for the Friars Club in Beverly Hills and I said uh do they have a piano at the Friars Club and they said yeah and I said uh go 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 get him and bring him to the piano 
and I like went over to this piano at this cantina, which was noisy and stuff. And I sat down, didn't ask anyone's permission, and just started playing um, "What I Say" by Ray Charles on the piano, just just crushing it. Wow. And he walked over, watched me, and then I finished, and I was singing too. Mm -hmm. I finished. And I was like, hey, Ari, nice to meet you. I'm a comedian. I, sh I would love to come play the piano sometime at the Friars Club. And he was like, can you start Thursday? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, I'll pay you 40 bucks a night, but you have to wear a suit. You can't dress like this. You look like shit. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and uh, that leap to working at the Friars Club and being their, their resident piano player, very quickly went from me being the resident piano player to me being the piano player for the pre-show and post-show and then that went to me being the host of the show of the of their comedy show and then that went to like me being the host of their comedy show on the weekends when the biggest comedians would come to perform and then um it I, it made the leap to me uh uh being asked by uh, Sarah Silverman to close out a show that she had to leave early. So she let me follow her basically. And, uh, and that performance that night was the, was when I became a paid regular at the Hollywood improv and uh, in, uh, and, and, and got asked to audition to be a paid regular at the comedy store. And I mean, it's like, so you can you can watch the the line happen where you go like oh if I wouldn't have done this then this wouldn't have happened if I wouldn't have done this then this wouldn't have happened and like that's happened a couple times in my life you know where where you 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 know you take a chance you give a you give an extra push you know you decide to skip work to go to an audition you know things like that like. The, those things have happened a few times, but there was never a part of me that was like, oh, I could also be a teacher or, oh, I could also work as an accountant. Like, <laughs> I, I'm uh, not smart. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I am not good at, at other things. Like, I'm good at, at what I'm good at. I'm a good writer. I'm a solid actor. I'm a solid musician, a solid singer. Like I, I, I'm a good comedian. Like I don't, I don't have other skills. So it, it's what I have to do. It's what I've always wanted to do. I've never had like a, a moment where I was like, maybe I should give this up and go live in, you know, some, do some bullshit. It's like, I, I, I if I had any bad jobs, like I always had jobs. I didn't have like, I wasn't trying to get good at being a security guard or working at Legoland. You know what I mean? Like I just, I just, I got fired a lot, but that's because I was, but that's because I was good at something else, you know? Sure. I mean, you speak it, you speak about it with such passion and all and your passion, like clearly comes through in all of the work that you do, whether it be on TV or your podcast or your music. Um, and oh. specifically talking about your music, I know you already mentioned that you um, are working on like recording your, your debut album. And I wanted to hear about what that experience has been like um, and what we can expect in terms of the music you hope to release in the future. Yeah. Oh, that's so nice. Thank you asking um it's been really cool um the songs that have been recorded for the album are let's see make you feel my love by adele classic um so good um when the party's over by billy eilish um when, uh, uh, Everything I Wanted by Billie Eilish. Um, I think uh, How to Disappear Completely by Radiohead. No Surprises by Radiohead. Circles by Post Malone. Losing My Religion by R.E.M. Um, 
Runaway Train by Soul Asylum, Raining in Baltimore by The Counting Crows. I love and it. There's a couple, there's a couple more. Um, and then single, single wise of the singles, um, How to Save a Life I did with Kendall. Yes, I listened um, to that. And I have to say like, I, that's like without a doubt, like one of my fa- all time favorite songs. And so like when you guys released that, I was so excited and I loved you guys' rendition of it. Oh, it was so fun. I love doing it. I, I, and I love Kendall. He's the sweetest guy in the whole world. It was very, very nice of him to be down to, to do something together. And Logan and I have talked about doing something too. It's just, it's hard. It's, it's hard. It's not, it's hard to lock people in and, and, uh, and also figure out what's the right song and what to do and how you want to do it and stuff. It's just, you know, it's, uh, it's tricky, but Kendall and I have been friends for a very long time and and we are very close and talk on a usually but once a week once every two weeks so this was a a nice collab and it's a good song it's solid um i put out river by joni mitchell i did that one with casey abrams from american idol um and i did uh uh idiotech by radiohead with Jesse, Jesse Green, um, the violinist for the Foo Fighters. Oh. So that came out, those three are out. And then Crazy by Norris Barkley um, is just me on piano. And that has been pretty viral on TikTok. I've, I've been very blessed that I, I put out 22 seconds of the song and it has been played over 3,000 hours, wow. which is just crazy, just a crazy number. And and CeeLo retweeted it, which is also crazy. Like, literally, that's the name of the song. Um, <laughs> so that's, and I shot a music video for it, so I'm going to get to put a music video out. Uh, a lot of doing uh, music stuff, and then I've got a list of like other songs I want to do <laughs> that I'm working on, like slowly trying to figure out like um, um, A Thousand Years by Christina Perry. Um, I, uh, I really, really want to do and I have like kind of a special uh, rendition of that that I'm working on with a very special person and um, a couple a couple other ones that are like, you know, just mean a lot that you're like oh i should try to do this or whatever but um the crazy part about it and y- you'll get this is that like i've been talking myself out of doing an album for years and years and years because it's like who cares? Like, why would anyone, in my mind, it's been like, why would anyone care that the manager of the band from Big Time Rush is going to put out an album? You know what I mean? I like, care, sir, I care. That's very sweet of you. But you know what I mean? Like, in my no, I totally brain, understand. I totally my brain it. made a very good argument for it to not happen. It was just like, well, well you know, that's not what fans want. Fans want you know the the boys the guys like that that's who they that's who they you know like i i'm like i've always been kind of the the you know like a like a piece of it but not i'm you know it's like it's different it's different when it's those you know the the boys um so you know the 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 boys um are, are such, they're such great guys. And I, I love those guys so much. And I just was like, well, what, why, why would anyone, why, why would anyone care? You know? And you do this. And then, and then also, then also it's like my little sister is a real musician. Like my, my little sister and her girlfriend, I've gone and tour, I've gone and watched them on tour. Um, they, they were the opening act for Ben Harper and uh the innocent criminals and i i went and watched them in reno nevada perform for ten thousand people on a stage that also housed an airplane like the stage they were performing on 
backstage, there was a 747 parked behind the stage. Crazy. That was just on the stage. It was part of a set. And it was like, I was like, this is, that's, I've already, I mean, they, I've already seen someone else do it. And, and you just watch and just go like, oh, wow. Like, that's really amazing. Like, uh, I don't know how she's, I've performed personally in front of maybe a couple thousand people, mm-hmm. but, you know, like on stage at one time, but watching her gave me a lot of like, like it, it, it made it seem like, oh, maybe this is real. Maybe I, maybe I could do it at some point. And she, my sister's so encouraging and was like, you got to do it. You got to make an album. You got to make an album. And so uh, then I did a TikTok live. And when I went live on TikTok for the first time to do like, you know, song thing where like I take song requests, uh, 42,000 people tuned in. And uh, it scared the shit out of me. Sure, yeah. <laughs> you're like, you're like, let's take some song requests. And it's just like, just the comments are flying. And I'm like, trying to catch them and then I would do a song I did a half hour uh, for 42,000 people and then I was like okay I'm gonna try it again a couple days later and I was like maybe there's something maybe it was just a fluke and then it was 50 53,000 a couple days later and it has continued to be these huge numbers on these lives we're like I could do a lot of different things on a live with that many people but it feels like it's like doing a, a a stadium like it is a very intense feeling and then people screen record your yeah. live and then they post it mm-hmm. and so like you just you want to be good you want to be nailing the songs that you're doing but you know sometimes I don't like sometimes it's not the song isn't right or it's the wrong key or whatever and you know learning learning how to uh adjust has been really cool anyways I'm I love it I love music and um that's amazing i'm such a huge fan of all these people and god those billy eilish songs i gotta tell you they're they're crazy amazing oh my god that's wait awesome. till you hear them they're so neat they came i'm out also really curious cool. i mean obviously covid has complicated a lot of things have you been doing this all from like just your home or have you been able to get inside of a recording booth or do you have I a- have I, I I have a recording studio in Woodland Hills that I, I work with and so I go there on a pretty regular basis right. um and uh we're super I have a um a mixer guy that I work with out there and he's super safe and then um Greg Collins is is actually the one who's producing my album and Greg um uh, won the Grammy for best album of the year for producing U2's album and he also has produced every single No Doubt album that's ever existed like wow. he and and Kiss he produced uh, most of uh, Kiss's big albums he is a very famous Grammy winning music producer and he volunteered to to produce my album and mix it and and uh, it's it's been a wonderful thing and that and what's so cool is in my connection with him came through jeff ross the stand-up comedian the roast master uh guy he uh we we knew each other through him and yeah so that's been really cool i've gotten to do one day with with greg because i did this adele song and um it sounded good and he was like yeah but we could we can make it sound better come into the studio and i got to sing on a fourteen thousand dollar microphone uh to, to redo the adele song because it was like adele is one of those people it's those those vocals are so important you know it's like you gotta you gotta crush it you know it's a lot of big a lot of big notes so he brought in he brought in this amazing mic from london and then i got to go and sing on it, it was so cool it was so cool I love that. I'm so excited to hear the rest of your album. We're we're all ears. Um, so kind of segueing into some of your other projects. I mean, you yourself are a very seasoned veteran in the podcast world. Um, you've been hosting the nighttime show since I believe 2006. Yeah. Like, what specifically was it about the podcast medium that attracted you? Oh, sure. Um, I did a. 
there was a show called Party Time with Jessica Hall on the Playboy radio, on Playboy radio. And she asked me to sub in for someone during Big Time Rush. I think it was like third season or something. Her co-host took off uh, to, to go do uh, The Bachelor, I think. <laughs> and she asked me if, if I would sub in as her co-host. And I got to I got to interview like a bunch of people and I loved it. It was on Sirius XM at the time. And you know, millions of people were listening. And I just I loved being uh super vulnerable and talking about, you know, you know, relationship stuff and funny stories and all sorts of stuff. And I just loved it. And then um, my friend Kate Quigley was doing this podcast called Date Fails. And I, at the time, was, uh, you know, I had been through a lot of bad dates and had a lot of dating stories I could fill a book with. (laughs) And uh, her and I talked and I joined as her co-host. And we did about 100 episodes together. And it was really fun, but as it was something that happened it, while doing it is she really loved interviewing um, comedians. And I don't care about talking to comedians for the most <laughs> part. Like I'm friends with comedians. I don't mind co-hosting with comedians, but I don't want to sit and interview comedians about their life and their relationships like who gives a shit like it was like also it's just like these are people that i'm with all the time it'd be like if you were a you know what i mean it just doesn't it doesn't make it it's like all the stories are uh, basically the same we're bad at it you know we have bad dates it's like that's but to me what i wanted to learn about was like people in the industry learn about their history, learn about how their their job affects their life, how their career has moved and changed over the years. And I was more interested in that than I was just in dating stuff. Like I really wanted to get deeper into the careers of people. And I'm a Hollywood fanatic. I know everything about everything when it comes to like, the. I, I mean, at least if I don't know everything, I want to know everything. Like I just... I'm so obsessed with the history of, of the entertainment industry in music, television, comedy, every, you know, everything, you know, movies. I, I want to know all that stuff. Um, and I have uh, three, three guys that I am friends with that I uh, are one of them. A couple of them are like, they're, they're like my best friends and they're, uh, I've known each of them a uh, different amounts of time. One, one of them I've known my entire 16 years. I've known one guy, the other guy I've known 10 years, the other guy I've known five years and they're all brilliant. One of them uh, was nominated for an Emmy a couple of years ago um, and knows everything about writing and stuff like that. One of them is a, science fiction aficionado and knows absolutely everything about star wars marvel and dc and comic books and all that kind of stuff and then the other guy is a game show fanatic and knows every single game show host in the history of game shows and knows every single thing about anything you can think of when it comes to star trek so between the four of us we are just a nerd coliseum of, of <laughs> weird nerdiness. So we decided, the four of us, let's do a podcast together. And we would rotate out. So it'd be only three of us, you know, per episode. Um, so we we do, we rotate around and stuff like that. And we started, um, you know, doing the show because I, we just wanted to, you know, have something fun to to do together that's consistent. And it, man, nighttime show has has helped me through so many bizarre years. Where there's a year where I didn't work, I didn't have a job for the entire year, and all I did was do the podcast. There's years where I was working nonstop, but I couldn't talk about it publicly because I was at Warner Brothers and there's, you know, NDAs. Um, And so to have a thing 
where you can where you can stay active you know and see your friends and interview your famous your favorite people it's uh it's pretty i mean it's pretty crazy that show that show has led to some moments that i i i am truly truly lucky to have been able to have um i'll tell you one favorite yes i'll please. tell you as many favorites as you want <laughs> one, no, one in particular i have watched the office from beginning to end every episode mm -hmm. three or four times at this point um because of that of of having the show i got it i got to interview uh kate flannery meredith from the office yes, right big fan it was super cool then we decided to interview to do our interviews live on stage at the improv saturday night 10 p.m main room of the club then we got to have uh uh miss uh meredith uh, uh, Kate Flannery and Oscar Nunez. So we had the two of them. We did th this really fun interview with the two of them, half hour, it's hysterical, right? Then um, Kate Flannery gets asked to do Dancing with the Stars, right? So sh she's doing the show, she's killing it. LA Comic Con decides they're gonna do the reunion of the cast reunion. And they ask her because she's the busiest um, at the moment. They're like, "Hey, anybody you want to host the uh, the big live, you know, mm -hmm. stage, uh, you know, reunion?" And she was like, "Yeah, Stephen Glickman and the Nighttime Show." Wow. <laughs> so L.A. Comic Con brings me, Mike Black, Matt Walker, and Mike Glazer to L.A. Comic Con. And we stand on stage in front of 10,000 people. And I have my guys in the audience with microphones taking questions from 10,000 people. It was the most physically insane thing I've ever done on, on a show. Like, so intense. 10,000 people, a lot of fucking people. I and the imagine. screens, the laughs were just, I mean, they would hit like a tidal wave. Like, it just it felt so good so um yeah the podcast has taken us to some pretty interesting places for sure that's amazing to hear and i mean we are just now getting started with our podcast you know and, and like you said it's just something that we started because you know we wanted something to do with our best friends and so hearing you say that yeah. is uh, really amazing and it's so cool because like by doing that with your friends like the way you guys are doing it the dynamic feels real. It's it doesn't feel like corporate, yeah. you know, like and and the longer that you do it, the crazier it's going to get. It's just going to keep building and there gets to be a point where you can be like like a year a couple of years ago, we had a list. You know, we've always had a list who we want on the show, you know. And we were like, Kevin Smith, if we could get Kevin Smith on the show, that'd be the coolest thing ever. And uh, we asked, he said no. Then a couple of years later, we asked again, just wasn't the right time. And then uh, a couple of weeks ago, we interviewed him and uh, we spent an hour, 45 minutes with Kevin Smith for, for our 200th episode. It's wow. just an interview with him. And half the interview is him interviewing us about how we came together, why why this works and all that kind of stuff. And uh, one of the cool things that he said that I think applies to you guys and, a, and a, applies, to, applies to us too, is when, whenever you're doing, uh, a, a lot of times in life, people will say, you never stick with anything. You know, that, that's a that's a mean thing to say. And people say that kind of stuff like, oh, you're so inconsistent. You never stick to anything. You come up with something, but you never stick to it. Blah, 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 blah. And that's uh, doing a podcast is is the proof that you can stick with something. You just have to stick with the thing with the right thing. You have to find something sticky enough to get stuck to it. And that's yeah. the way he said it. And it just 
It's so true. I have been told so many times, oh, you never, oh, you just, you're into this and then you're into that. And it's like, yeah, well, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't good enough, you know? And then when you find the thing that was right, you find the thing that works. It's like, you guys have this awesome show. Stick with it. Keep, you know, still. It, you know? I mean, we, we started developing the show, like, maybe two months ago i want to say and like even thinking back then like we were like when thinking about who we who, what kind of people we wanted to talk to like never in a million years did we think that we would be sitting sitting across from you and getting to interview you oh get out of here truly i mean mel's gonna go into this in a little bit but we are genuinely such big fans like we grew up watching big time rush it's, it has such a big impact on us and so being able to pick your brain being able to have this conversation with you and being able to share it on our show that means so much to us so thank you so much it. again for being here um but speaking of Big time rush. If we want to start segueing into our little game that we have planned, do it. Do you want to take it away? Okay. So um, before we go deeper into like big time rush and you being Gustavo, obviously, as most of our viewers probably know you, um, we're gonna do a little game. So um, as this is gonna work, I'm basically gonna tell you the title of a song. For example, for the uh, for the example, we have the song Twenty Four Seven, and I would ask you hard or easy, you would give me an answer. And then I would say something like all day, every day is a holiday. And you would finish then the lyric, which would be for this example, we're all, we'll, we're all right 24 seven. Okay. Okay. I'm going to start with the iconic intro song called Big Time Rush. Do you want the easy one or do you want the hard one? Hard one. Okay. The hard Going one. for it. <laughs> also, if you need a lifeline, Ella is your girl. I'm your lifeline. I think I can help you. I've seen that Thanks, show so many times. So. I appreciate okay. it, Ella. I really do. The lyric is, step it up, get in gear. Oh, step it up, get in gear. Oh, step it up, get in gear. Go for broke. Make yes. it clear. Yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. The next song, which is, I think, one of our favorites is Worldwide. Do you okay. want the easy or the hard one? Hard. Okay. A million pretty girls that know my name. Uh, but don't worry, you have my heart. I'll let it count. It's, but don't you worry, because you have my heart. But Close enough. Okay. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Good, okay. good. Good. The next one is the song Boyfriend, Easy or Hard. You know, I feel like I should go hard on this one, but <laughs> I may need some help on this. Okay, we're going hard and we'll see if you need your lifeline. It's, okay. have you ever had the feeling you're drawn to someone? And it isn't anything that you could have said or done? Yes. <laughs> there we go. See, I know, I know him a little bit. Watch, I'm not going to know the next one. <laughs> and the last song, which is Ella's favorite, is Count on You. Do you want easy or hard? Oh, that's one of the best songs they ever recorded. On the, on, on the set of that song, it was, uh, it was a lot of mouths dropped open. I mean, everybody in the cast and crew was was literally came back just to watch Jordan and, and them. And uh, they shot that on my birthday so that we were celebrating my birthday that day. And, and oh, I got I to spend that. my whole birthday with Jordan Sparks, which is like, and then what's so crazy is years later, um, it was my birthday and uh, I ran into Jordan on my birthday again. And it was like, wow. and then she sang happy birthday to me. Oh, because I asked her to sing happy birthday to me. And she said, uh, uh, pass. And then like ran away, like just like to screw with me. But like that that song, Count On You, is probably one of the one of the best songs they ever recorded. And probably my favorite music video out of all of them. I love that. It's my it's all my favorite on there. Oh, gorgeous, on their gorgeous. So. Okay, count on you. I, I'm pretty sure I know all the words to it. So give me the hard one. Okay, because you're the one I'm giving my heart to. Can you sing it? 
Ella. Because <laughs> you're the one I'm giving my heart to. Uh, Wait, what's the line before that? Maybe if I sing the line before that. Yeah, too. I, I don't know the line before it. Um, Hannah? Wait, I only have the snippet. Let's use quick with Googling. Baby, I'm counting on you. You're the one. Okay. I don't know. The, I don't know where in the song it happens. I think that's the the end of like the second verse. Maybe am I making that up? Wait, let me let me find the one. Wow. I know. I know. I feel like okay. So the line before anything I'm doing, I'm doing, girl. Uh, I'll drop it for you. Like anything, anything I'm doing, girl. I drop. Yeah. Oh, you're the one I'm giving my heart to. I don't know. Oh my god. I, I totally... Oh my god! It's wait, I think I know it is but I gotta be the only one. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh my god. And Brandon. then it goes into the chorus. One, two, three, four, two, five. <laughs> Baby, I'm on you. That would have been the easy one. What wait, what's the easy line? Just the one, easy two, three, one four. would have been one, two, three, four, two oh, to five. Okay. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's so a good. That's you got a, the easy one. one. We'll, yeah. give you, we'll give it. You got it. You got. It. <laughs> you know, um, uh, total like side note, but but uh, it reminded me of this, and I'm sure you guys will appreciate it. Is uh the song halfway there? If mm -hmm. you ever listen to uh to that song or see the episode where they do halfway there, mm -hmm. uh, the cast and crew were in tears while they were singing that song. That is a hundred percent true. And the reason why is because we didn't know if we were picked up for another season yet. And that was shot halfway through the first season. And Aww. everyone was having such a good time and felt so good about the show that they just wanted, uh, uh, they knew that that meant that we were halfway through uh, the season. And oh, I'm not kidding you, when I, when I say like, when I say captain crew, I mean like the sound guy was like holding the boom mic, like doing this, like <laughs> wiping tears Aww. off his face. It was so intense. I, I mean, so much. Kendall and I had a big talk about the show last night. Um, literally, we spent like an hour talking about mm -hmm. we and we don't really talk about it that often. And just because um, I I, we, I had a run in with. Uh, one of the guys that was a grip on the show. And then the same week I had a, a, a chat with the casting director and both of them said that they look back at the time of the show as one of the happiest sets and one of the happiest times of their lives. And like, in that, you know, these are people who've worked in the industry for 30 years and, you know, 40 years, like, and it's, it was just such an enormously happy experience, um, you know. And a lot of times, that's not the case. A lot of times, you got a network that's, you know, fighting you on stuff. You got a label that isn't cooperating, and you don't have enough money to do the thing you want to do. And you know, guest stars are rude, and this and that. It's like none of that. We were blessed with a very uh, happy uh, experience, all of us, which is crazy it's crazy that makes me so happy to hear i mean especially because i that show has become like my comfort show i rewatch it at least once a year i listen to the soundtrack all the time just because it's it just it makes you feel so good it's such a feel good show and i mean everything that you said about like how amazing it was to work on the show i feel like is a perfect segue into mel's questions just about what it was like to film the show totally yeah totally yeah, um, the show started filming in like 2009 and even today it's still a show that's like well watched within like the Nickelodeon world. Did you ever suspect that the show would be such a like not viral but that it became would become so popular? Um, I'll tell you this. Uh, I, I, I'm, I know that the, the answer to this probably should be something like i was so surprised i have no idea oh my god I, you would never 
I would never think I'd be still talking about this, all this, but that's not true. Um, because I was told how the show would do by the, by the president of the network. Mm -hmm. um, about a week before it premiered, I said to the president of the network, who's no longer the president, I said to her, uh, wow, I am uh, I'm so excited. I, I really hope kids like the show. And she said, um, they will. And I said, yeah, no, I know, like, hopefully, right? And she was like, no, they will. They're going to love it. They're going to absolutely love it. And I was like, <laughs> right, yeah, I mean, you know, fingers crossed, you know? And she was like, that's not how this works, Stephen. And I was like, that's not, what do you mean? And she was like, um, that's not how this works. That's not how children's television works. Like something is either going to be a success or it's, you know, gonna flounder. She goes, we put out shows that are both. Like there are shows like Super Ninjas that was a, came out the same time as our show. Good show. They liked it. They were happy that they were making it, but they didn't, uh, they knew it wasn't going to be a, an enormous hit. Um, but that's not anybody's fault. That's just at the time, what was, where things were supposed to be, where things were popular, how, what was going to happen, the way the cast was built out, all that kind of stuff, you know? Um, she said, to me uh kids are going to feel like if they don't watch the show they shouldn't go to school on monday that's what she said to me and i was like what she was like yeah it's it that's how this works we're gonna tell them it's the best show you guys are gonna make the best show we hired the best writers in the world we put together a cast that took years. Big Time Rush, the cast, the cast, those four boys, it took, I'm not, it, it wasn't like they held a casting thing and they picked out the guys and then- It they didn't happen the playing. way that it happened in the TV show. <laughs> no, no, it took two and a half years, almost three years to find Logan, Carlos, James, and Kurt. Then we shot a pilot and then they were like, Kurt's too old, fired Kurt, and then spent another year and a half searching for Kendall, and then they found Kendall. So it, it's the same, similar. The only similarity I have to it is uh, Marvel's Avengers uh, Endgame. When they made, when Marvel made Avengers Endgame, they spent 340 45 million dollars or so making marvel's endgame right they did that knowing that it was going to be a hit because and they invested in it that way they got the best possible people to work on it and they they, they it could have flopped it could have it could have come out and people could have hated it but but they they really stacked their their deck they made sure that like Everybody that was working on the show was top tier, the best music producers, the best writers. Um, um, Gustavo was played by a different actor at the table read. And then uh, they finished the table read and they were like, fire him. We need somebody else. And they fired him on Thursday. I auditioned for the first time Friday and started filming Monday for five years. So they... They, they knew me through uh, animation as a voiceover person and they thought that I was really funny and they wanted to work with me. They just didn't know where to put me. And so when this spot opened, they were like, get him in there and they threw me in. But, you know, like it, it was, a I mean, just like writers alone, let's just talk writers alone on the show. Um, what uh, Jessica Gao. Jessica Gao was one of our writers, just one of like eight writers writing on Big Time Rush. Jessica Gao finished writing uh, Big Time Superheroes for, uh, for our Big Time Rush superhero episode. 
finishes writing that that season ends jessica leaves to go and write a tv show called star wars the clone wars then after that she goes over and writes a tv show called rick and morty and writes pickle rick and wins the emmy for writing pickle rick now jessica gow is the writer of she hulk for marvel the only writer she's the the only writer for it like everyone that worked on our show all the way down to like the just the pieces and parts you know they have all gone on to do enormous enormous things because they got the best possible people so that's kind of it was a weird lesson in kind of like how television shows are made and how people invest you know in uh in stuff because uh the network was super invested in us i'm so lucky that i got you know i got cast and got to be a part of it because it totally changed my life and i and then i not to like keep talking but um when when the when the show ended there was like about two years where things got quiet for me where like uh fans you know like were kind of like looking for the show and it'd be on you know team nick but that was kind of it you know and i kind of remember kind of being like well it's dying down i guess i can go off and do the next part of my career and work on the next thing and you know, like on Twitter, just the mentions, being called Gustavo on Instagram, things like that. It just kind of started to die down. And I was able, I was like, okay, well, that's what it is. That's that's the end of that. And then Hulu buys the show. And then it just goes crazy. And then it becomes like a viral thing where, where I go to uh, every single store in Los Angeles, any store I go to in Los Angeles, the employees are now in their 20s and they're all big time rush fans and you're like you know and you and you start you start you go into halloween town during halloween and the staff freaks out and you're like oh my god this is crazy that show was 10 years ago and they're like it was my childhood you know and you're like "Ah." so i love it i i love that it keeps finding new life and new uh yeah. and new fans it's it kind sense. of crazy how streaming platforms have really changed the game of how television works and like the lifetime and the lifespan of a television show and the way that it like revitalized it in a way oh absolutely i mean giving giving people that you know there was no binge watching like you know 10 years ago 15 years ago there was nothing like that so for you know, for young people who grew up on something to be able to go back and binge watch it is like, you know, it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, when it's I crazy. first watched it, I had to wait every week. I had to wait a full week until the next episode. <laughs> so. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, then my one of my friends is a big Star Trek fan. You know that I do my podcast with, and he used to have to watch it late night on tv old star trek episodes and you know on weird and it's now he can just sit there and watch every single episode back to back to back to back on streaming services and it's like it's crazy it's just a a different world it It really is yeah when when i grow up uh when i grew up uh i heard about the show online but since I'm in Germany, I had to wait like a year until it came to Germany so I could watch it, which now when a show comes out in America, I can watch it the next day. So streaming. Oh. Are really- you in Germany right now? Yes. She is. Wow. Oh, I love I love Germany. There's um I I talk to people from Germany constantly that grew up watching it, which I like. I love that. That's so cool. And Germany is such a beautiful place. I mean, my God, it's amazing. Pretty. It's, I think it's still snowing. I don't know. It's pitch black outside. <laughs> but yeah. um, so talking more about Big Time Rush and filming, you said that a lot of the cast, like you were really close. What was like during filming? What was like besides them singing count on you on your birthday um what was like your favorite memory from filming big time rush uh wow i have 
It's a big trying to decide story. if I want to tell you a horrifying story or a really funny story. Both. Um, <laughs> which one do you want? You want the worst story or you want a great story? I'm trying to decide. Give us both. Um, okay, they they um, spending time with those boys um, and with Tanya, um, who played Kelly. Uh, her and I were very, very, very close. We are still very close, but we got to have a lot of adventures. Probably my favorite thing that happened, you know, one of my favorite things to do was uh, we would steal golf carts on the set of uh, Big Time Rush at Paramount, and we would drive the golf carts all over the lot and go visit the other shows. And um, I had a golf cart key that I had stolen um, from my job at Legoland, California, when I was a security guard. I stole their golf cart key. It was like a universal golf cart key. So I would hop into a golf cart with uh, Logan or Kendall or one of the boys or, or Tanya. And we would just go drive off and we'd go over to the set of Community and go see Joel McHale and, and, um, and you know, Donald Glover and, that, and their cast. And, and um, the, the directors of Community were um, uh, Joe and Anthony Russo, who had directed uh, the first show I was on on ABC back in the back in the day, and Joe and Anthony uh, Russo directed uh, Avengers: Endgame and Captain America and all those movies. So it was a cool, and they're directing Sierra Bravo, little Sierra Bravo from Big Time Rush, um, in her new movie Cherry, with uh, where she's Tom Holland's girlfriend, which is so weird, so weird. Um, but long story short, long story short, we would drive over there. We'd go to the, the Glee set and go bother the Glee cast and go eat their food and sneak into their craft service room, which they had the best craft service. I mean, chocolate covered strawberries and handmade toaster strudels, those sons of bitches. And they had a, they had a Keurig machine before anybody else. So we would steal their coffee because they had really good coffee. And um, it was so, it was so fun. Um, and I was very, I was very close with uh, a bunch of the cast. Uh, Corey Monty was one of my dearest friends, and such a sad, sad loss with him. But uh, um, I was, I was pretty close. I'm still very uh, close with Kevin, uh, who was in the wheelchair, you know, on the show. Uh, and we've, we've remained uh, good friends. And um, a couple, a couple of the the cast members, um, and. Uh, even Matt Morrison uh, and Heather, oh my God, Heather was like the like one of the nicest people ever. And Matthew Morrison was like just such a sweetheart. Liam Michelle, uh, not so much, but everybody else was so so nice, so <laughs> lovely. Um, yeah, she was not, not not a super nice person, but everybody else was so great. It's okay, it happens. Um, she's also like the the main star, and you know she had been a big Broadway star before that. Like she's she she doesn't always have to be super nice, um, but but we uh, we had like a that was probably the funnest was just getting on golf carts and screwing around and getting in trouble, uh, you know, because getting on trouble on a lot is a very different thing than getting in trouble in real life. You know, like we were about to shoot a scene. And they were like, Stephen, where's your glasses? Your big yellow glasses. And I was like, searching my, I don't know. They were like, well, we need them. You know, you were just wearing them. Where'd you put them? And I was like, oh. and we're looking everywhere. They're searching the entire set. We have to stop filming to find the yellow glasses. Can't find them. Go in my dressing room everywhere. Going all over the place. And, uh, Finally, I'm like, maybe I left them on the set of Community. And they're like, what were you doing on Community? And I was like, I, we were hanging out. And they were like, go to Community. And so I walk across to Community and I'm like, has anyone seen my yellow glasses? And Joel McHale's like, these glasses? And I was like, ah, oh, Joel. And it was like, that kind of stuff only can happen on a lot. Like, you, you know, I worked on a show called Workaholics on Comedy Central, which was so much fun. But 
they there was there weren't on a lot that was an office building that they had torn apart to like use so there's no fun run-ins with anybody from other shows there's no like you know you don't run into dr phil you know when you're going to park your car like you know like that's that's a really fun part of uh of filming for sure i miss that a lot i miss that a lot so what's the worst part Oh, uh, one time, um, Kendall, James, Logan, and Carlos decided to go into my trailer while we were on location and all use my bathroom at the same one after another, not, uh, not flush. And then they all left my trailer and then my mom was visiting and I was like, mom, come see my super cool trailer. And we walked in and she was like, oh my God, your trailer smells horrifying. What the fuck, Stephen? And I was like, I don't know what's going on. Why does it smell so bad in here? And then we go out of the trailer, my mom and I, and Kendall, James, Carlos, and Logan are crying laughing. They're just falling on top of each other laughing. And I'm like, you sons of bitches, someone go fix that. It was, uh, yeah, they, uh, they really, they really ruined my, my dressing room, my, uh, my place. They did that a couple of times. They did other weird stuff to me. They once went into my dressing room when my dressing room was a mess. They took all the things, the, the, the tags and the empty glasses and the candy wrappers, things like this. And they took scotch tape and they scotch taped all the trash from my tra little trash bin to the wall in my dressing room. Um, they also once uh, booby trapped my dressing room so that when I sat on my couch, water would splash in my face. Um, they did a lot of things. They did a lot. They messed with me a lot, a lot, a lot. I loved it, but. Well, they basically did what the boys would do to Gustavo. Yeah, Pretty basically. Cool. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, from filming Big Time Rush, what is like one thing you learned about yourself as an actor? Oh, uh, before I did the show, I, I was just a mostly a theater actor. So I would yell a lot, um, oh, you know, even in rehearsals. I would yell at full volume, you know, if I had to scream and yell, um, they would say, you can mark, which means, you know, you can, uh, you can like pretend of how it's gonna be. But I always wanted to do full performance all the time. So I blew my voice out numerous times while, while filming Big Time Rush. Like I got laryngitis, I got strep throat, I got tonsillitis. You know, I was constantly tearing my voice in half, uh, screaming on the show. And by around season two, I'd figured out how not to do that. But, you know, in the beginning, I just wanted to put it, I wanted to leave it all out on the table. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I learned how to, how to perform for television, really, you know? That's actually one of the questions that Melina had for you was we were going to ask about your voice just because, like, in every single episode, you are full on, like, like yelling and belting at these boys and so we I was always really impressed by just the level like the caliber of just like intensity that you were always able to maintain with that so it's impressive to hear <laughs> oh I really didn't want to uh yeah they would always be like oh you can just you know kind of just kind of bullshit it today and I'd be like I don't want to bullshit it I want to go full volume every time you know That's even when I <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it made it made the character, you know, real. It made him like a legitimate, you know, living, breathing person. And a lot of uh, a lot of research went into to the character too. I got to I got to do that for the first time in my life, really. Where you know, like when you're uh, when you're you know learning about acting, they. You know, they, they say like, oh, you got to build a character, but you need to research, you know, and um, not, you know, very, it's very often that you get to really do real serious research on a, 
on who you're playing uh, because there isn't always time for that, you know, like, but on this one, I got really lucky. I got to, I got to spend time with uh, over the years, I got to spend time with a lot of different record producers. Um, some pretty, uh, pretty famous ones too. I got to, I got to be in the studio with Wu-Tang Clan and spend time with uh, the RZA and the Jizza, which was pretty serious and uh, learn from them and see how they operate in a, in a recording studio. Um, um, I got, uh, I got to meet Randy Jackson and uh, spend a little time with him. We're still friends and still very cool. Couple, a couple people I got, I got to, you know, really see up close, which was really neat, really cool. Yeah, and you work with like so many like big names and have done so much in your career so far. What is like one thing you would tell anyone that wants to venture into this industry? Um, I'll say this, one of the best pieces of advice that I can give when it comes to this business is uh, just because you meet someone doesn't mean you should ask anything from them. Like that is like a huge, huge lesson. It took me a long time to learn because I always felt like you have to take the opportunity. People just say that kind of shit to you. They go, oh, you got to take the opportunity. If you're going to meet, you meet Will Smith, you, can, you know, how often does that happen? You know, you got to, you got to, you got to ask Will Smith to put you in a movie or ask him if you can meet his agent or whatever. It's like, it's the worst possible advice. Just be nice, be kind, be generous, and um, and be polite. And then the next time that you meet Will Smith, then he'll go, hey, good to see you, bud. How you been? And then the third time, it'll be like, hey, what's up, Steven? Good to see you. And then the fourth or fifth time, he'll be like, so what's up with you? What have you been up to? What do you, you know, because then they're like, I don't have to, he hasn't asked me for a single thing. So now it's like, well, how can I help you? You know, how can we do something together? If you, because that's, that's where you want things to go. You, you, you want to be able to network with people without, um, without seeming desperate or seeming needy. And, uh, and the way to do that is to just be super polite, super kind, and just keep grinding on your own. And, and it will attract other people. Like I'm a big fan of NSYNC. Always loved NSYNC. Been a big fan of Joey Fatone for a very long time. Um, and uh, we would see each other a lot uh, at events and things. Always kept quiet. You know, I always, I always was nice to him. We would always talk, we'd have some laughs. But that was it, nothing more than that. And then after about five times of doing that, he was like, what are you up to? after the thing and I was like nothing and he was like you want to go to Hooters and I was like hell yeah I want to go to Hooters <laughs> so we went to Hooters and we had hot wings together and by the end of it we had developed an idea for a pilot and then a week later we shot a pilot with Nick Lachey Alfonso Ribeiro from Fresh Prince Joey Fatone and um and another guy and it was so cool it was awesome but it was like one of those things it's like I would, if I would have gone to that on day one, it never would have happened. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, and also the other big thing is if you're trying to get in the industry, the big question, big misconception is that uh, you have to get an agent, you got to get a manager. Um, that, is not, that is not the case. You, uh, actors do not get agents and managers. Uh, agents and managers get actors. And if you spend all of your time trying to find that person, you're putting a lot of faith into who they are and what they can do for you. That's really not how it works. Like when you're an, when, when you've done some short films or you've done some student films, they've gotten to some festivals and you, you know, you'll be at a, you'll be at a, a screening of some short film that you did. And someone will come up to you and be like, hey, I work for an agency and I'm interested in you. Or they'll reach out to you online and be like, oh, I watched the video that you did. And, uh, you know, we, we'd be interested in having a conversation. That's how it works. It never goes the other way. And, and it, it is a terrible relationship when it does. 
if you search out an agent and beg them to represent you, mm -hmm. ugh, it's going to be gross. Mm -hmm. It's going to be gross. Then you're putting them in charge of you. You know, and that is, yeah. that does, that, that's not how that relationship works. You know? Yeah. Well, I love that that's the, in terms of like the first half of the advice that you gave about just being kind and authentic, like in the industry, like, I feel like so many people have a misconception about just because of how competitive and cutthroat, like entertainment can be that, you know, you have to be like ruthless and deceptive or shady, you know, but I, I just, I really love hearing you say that, you know, the, the key in, to success is really just to be good, kind people and to, you know, be hardworking and be genuine. Yeah. I mean, I'll say this to Ella is like um, when um, at the same time uh, you know there are moments that I have had there are moments that other I know a lot of people who have had where you where you have to be you get put in a position where it's like you have to be aggressive and you have to stand up for yourself and um like being kind and being genuine 100 percent is the way to go but don't let yourself get taken advantage of sure. if somebody is inappropriate with you or you know especially in present day if if uh you know you have a meeting with a manager and he makes like a sexual comment towards you or something like that fuck that and get out like mm -hmm. be aggressive and and push that don't be so polite that you get that 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 you let stuff go because you don't have to no one no one will ever think that there's anything difficult or hard about you i'm saying that for men and for women like it is, sure. it is you know i i i have had I have had some weird experiences where I've been walked on by people of power that have taken advantage of me being nice and have tried to have you know, been assholes. And, um, you know, they, they get written out of the book. They get, you know, pushed out because, because they're not supposed to be in my life, you know? So you just got to keep, keep that in mind. It's like, you got to be nice. But then also, if you're getting pushed around or someone's being rude to you or be inappropriate, like, fuck that. For you sure. Know? I know I, d I could definitely use that <laughs> advice more in my life. <laughs> well, I mean, you're Canadian, right? No, I'm, I'm the Canadian one. She's, Hannah's the Canadian I'm one. I'm the Canadian one. <laughs> oh, Hannah, Hannah, you're Canadian. Yeah, that is, we are way too nice, us yeah. Canadians. Hannah, you know? <laughs> she's has trouble saying no. <laughs> yeah, man, I get that. I get that. You know, it's a hard, it's a, it's a hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, just to kind of wrap us up um, on the topic of Canada, I did want to ask, is there anything that you miss about Canada? I know a lot of people who visit Toronto, especially they're like the ketchup chips. I miss the ketchup <laughs> chips because I can't get them anywhere else. But... Uh, coffee crisp. Coffee okay. crisp. What in we the world get... is a coffee crisp? <gasps> oh no. Oh, coffee crisp, it's a candy bar that that is coffee flavored and it's wafers with chocolate and coffee flavoring. It's uh they don't have them here. Uh Smarties, yeah. um uh, very superior to M&Ms. Um <laughs> yes. far superior. Um I I'd say I miss poutine, but I'd be lying. Um, <laughs> it's okay we're from Ontario we're not from Quebec it's you you don't have to miss poutine <laughs> oh okay yeah my family is all from Montreal so okay never um, mind then <laughs> yeah they they also have this thing in Canada that we don't have here called cheese bagel at least they have them in in Montreal where they were like horseshoe mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. uh like pastry that has like cheese on these god it's so good it's all food for me it's all food <laughs> one of the reasons other things i miss are food really that's, that's so how sad. i feel about home so <laughs> yes yes um and fam you know family and uh and and just people are so nice in canada like i i was traveling through canada to go uh my when my my grandfather passed and we were doing the drive from 
uh, California to Canada. And uh, we, were, we, we got to London, Ontario. And uh, I went into a restaurant by myself sat down and the waitress came over and was like how can i you know what can i get for you and i was like oh what's good she was like you doing okay and i was like i'm feeling a little depressed my grandfather just passed away and she was like are you by yourself and i was like yeah she was like do you want me to join you and i was like she's like standing there with the pad you know i was like join me and she was like yeah i'll take my break and we'll have lunch i was like uh, okay and she was like hey Paul I'm gonna take uh my lunch now and then just sat down at the table and then another waiter was like oh hey what can I get you to and I was like what is this place that I'm in what why would this person want to sit with me and it was like um it was crazy it was like it was awesome but it was it was a trip and it was I'm I'm pretty sure it was pre big time rush too. So, you know, it wasn't like a fan thing. It was just people Genuine being nice. person being nice. Yeah. Oh God, Canada. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, the, the, girl, the girl that I'm seeing, um, that I, I've been seeing for the last few months that I'm very, uh, uh happy about is, uh, is Canadian and, uh, it's the fucking greatest thing in the world. <laughs> the best. Anyways, sorry. That's awesome. So, okay, so wait, so this is going to be a controversial question, but I, hopefully it doesn't, it doesn't take us on a derail, but uh, your family's from Montreal, you're from London, what's your hockey team? I gotta know. Oh, wow. Uh, Maple <laughs> Leafs, probably? Okay, okay. <laughs> we can be friends. We can be friends. <laughs> yeah, yes. I am very bad at sports, and uh, I'm Jewish, <laughs> so we're not we're not typically great at sports or knowing a lot about sports like someone had to tell me today is the super bowl as um, i did not <laughs> i had no idea we don't have football here so you know you i'm just watching there the leafs play that's it I'm like okay leafs let's go <laughs> awesome well Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. We had a fantastic time talking to you and just getting to just pick your brain about a lot of different things. Um, I mean, you've said some very inspirational things, very motivational things um, that I think our viewers would just be so glad to hear. Um, and we just want to say thank you again, just for hanging out with us for the last. I time. loved doing this. This was so nice. I, I, you know, I'll do it anytime. So just, you know, keep in touch and, uh, well, uh, well, we'll maybe I'll I'll bring you some fun guests. Maybe there's some fun people I know who could who could come to do this. Oh, for sure. Thank, awesome. Thank you for your time. You've been so generous with your time, and we really oh, uh, you guys are the best. And that's girl stuff.